All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Cupertino for All. We're hosting this entire event, Get Local, How to Join Cupertino Boards and Commissions. We're going to wait a little bit longer as we have the kind of last groups of people trickling in. Uh, so it should be another like three to four minutes before we really start in earnest. Uh, but as we do start, we might as well take a look at what our roadmap for today's session is going to be. So uh, as far as the event goes, we're going to have a brief introduction, which you are currently sitting through uh, from myself, as well as from City Councilman Hung Wei, who's here with us today. We will then get a board and commission overview. Um, following that, we'll have a panel with some city commissioners uh, featuring Connie Cunningham and Nisha Tambe. Uh, after that, we'll have a second panel with county commissions and commissioners uh, featuring Tara Srinikrishnan and Raina Lari. And then after that, we'll get to our big Q&A session where any questions you may have uh, accumulated during the entire course of today's session, you'll be able to direct to any panelist or speaker that we've had with us today. Um, so like I said, we'll wait just a few more minutes to let everyone get in. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us and just bear with us for like one or two more minutes. Uh, and as we're waiting, uh, feel free to, you know, do the little introductions in the chat. I know there's lots of us here today. Uh, I've bullied my entire family into joining us with us today. So, uh, you know, feel free to say hi to each other, family. Hi, family. <laughs> Hello, family. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> Everyone here is family to me. Oh. Hi, family. Alrighty. It looks like um, most of our most of the, our folks have kind of trickled in. We'll we'll let other people join in as we go along. Uh, it looks like our speaker for uh, our local boards and commissions overview isn't quite with us here yet. So we'll kind of circle back to that component a little bit later on. But at first, let me uh, do the blatant self-promotion, get that one out of the way first, while well, as I talk about Cupertino for All. Uh, so we're the people who invited you all out here today. Uh, Cupertino for All is a resident-led organization that's uh, seeking to build a more sustainable, vibrant, and equitable Cupertino through policy, advocacy, education. Some of the stuff that we're primarily concerned with is housing and uh, transportation issues, but we really take an interest in all aspects of Cupertino's civic life that uh, involve creating a more welcome, welcoming and inclusive Cupertino for both, all, uh, both our current residents and for potential new residents. This year alone, we've done lots of exciting stuff. We've hosted town halls on the current uh, crises facing our school system. We've uh, mobilized dozens of speakers to go towards city and regional events and speak out in favor of things that we're concerned about. And we've helped turn out lots of volunteers for the 2020 election. And speaking of that 2020 election, we're, we were really proud uh, to have a bunch of stellar candidates that we were supporting in municipal and ra uh, municipal races, including uh, the highest ever vote getter in the history of Cupertino municipal politics, Councilman Hung Wei, who's here to tell us all about why she thinks it's important to have so many folks here who are interested in boards and commissions. Uh, Hung, if you'd like to say some words. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. I am Hung Wei. I am very honored and also happy to serve as Cupertino City Council. I want to invite everyone to be part of democracy. We live in a very diverse and a very big country. How can we achieve um, to resolve conflicts and to serve not just for the people who only who have, but for the people who don't have? It is through democracy, through government. So I am inviting every one of you, if you're not part of your local government, to apply to be part of one of the commissioners because commission is a, is a, uh, is a great uh, place where you can contribute to democracy and learn about cities and counties. So I welcome you and there are openings both at the city level and county levels for you to participate. It is an official position, it's actually very official. You have um, city staff and county staff to help you and you will learn a lot of things and you'll contribute your talent, your passion and your time and resources 
I welcome you to be part of the city of Cupertino and of course the county of Santa Clara. So hopefully you'll learn from our current or past commissioners and be part of governance to bring our country into democracy, to serve the people who don't have what they need to have. So welcome, thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, wonderful to hear from you, wonderful to have you here, Hum. Uh, so like I said, uh, unfortunately, Larissa is not with us just yet. So we'll circle back around to this panel and we'll go directly on uh, to our two city commissioners. We'll have two separate panels, like I said earlier, one with city commissioners and one with county level officials. So we'll begin with our city commissioners. Um, oh, that's the wrong way. Featuring our very, uh, Connie Cunningham, who is a housing commissioner and full disclosure, a CFA member, as well as Nisha Tambe, who is a Cupertino Parks and Recreation Commissioner. So uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, would you two mind telling us a little bit more about the commission you serve on and your experiences as a commissioner? We'll start with Connie for alphabetical reasons. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here this morning uh, to talk about being a commissioner. Uh, I want to thank specifically Cupertino for all for hosting the event. Um, being appointed a housing commissioner in 2019 was a big step up for me uh, from my first cautious steps that I took into a Cupertino City Council meeting two years earlier. Um, my unlikely journey to Cupertino began in a small farming town in Nebraska. When dairy farming failed, <clears throat> my family moved west to other towns in other states where dad could find work. Um, when he landed a job with union benefits and with company provided housing in a small California town in the Mojave Desert along Route 66, my family's good luck began. And when I attended the University of California, um, it was my brass ring. Uh, it was work at NASA that eventually brought me to Cupertino where I've lived for 33 years. 33 years. Um, we moved here for the excellent schools as many have. So uh, that's a little about me. As far as the Housing Commission, um, our specific uh, work is on below market rate housing. Um, and on our work plan, there's the affordable housing strategies, um, extremely low income uh, project. Hopefully we'll get something like that going in the next year or so. And also grants that um, we uh, approve for, um, um, excuse me, all manner of, of folks that need help in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and how about yourself, Nisha? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited and it's a, it's a personal passion to also make sure that more community members get engaged. So really happy to be here. Um, again, my name is Nisha Tambe. I'm a commissioner on the Parks and Recreations Commission for the city of Cupertino. Um, I am completing my seventh year. I have one more year. I've been sitting for two terms. I was also a chairwoman for two of those terms. Uh, I consider myself to be a daughter of Cupertino, lived here my whole life. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I, I left for a bit to go to school in DC and then came back because there's no place like home. Um, I decided to join the commission. Actually, one of the former city council members um, had reached out to me, Gilbert Wong, and said, hey, you know, we have some openings. You are, you know, you have always been interested in serving your community. This is a really, you know, great way. To be honest, when I first joined, I or first applied or was looking into it, I wasn't really sure of like, am I the right person? Do I have the right experience? Um, am I qualified? Uh, but I picked a panel that I've had, you know, I've lived in Cupertino my whole life. So I picked the commission that I've had the most interaction with for my entire life because I've been very involved in so many of the programs that the, the city has offered throughout the course of my life. So this was a very direct way of uh, connecting into what the city was offering. Um, the Parks and Recreations Commission is specifically tasked with advising the city council on all things parks and recreation related. That's everything from making recommendations on 
you know, pieces of property that we can acquire to build out parks to actual recreation strategies, community services, and various engagements uh, throughout the community at multiple points. That includes everything from summer camps to, um, you know, what's happening at McClellan Ranch to, um, you know, Lawrence Mitty to Ranch Rinconada, all of that um, is, is pretty encompassed within Parks and Recreation. We do have a sizable chunk of, uh, of work that we do, um, but it is very impactful for the city. We also just completed um, our Parks and Recreation Master Plan, which is basically a master plan that will help advise what the city will look like in terms of Parks and Recreation for the next 25 years. So now we're in the strategic plan and implementation phase, uh, which we'll get to later on, but that's kind of a high level of how I got into the commission and what the commission does. Perfect. Thank you so much both for sharing your stories and like and very drastically different ways of getting into it. It's super <laughs> interesting. Um, so one question I think might be useful for uh, the audience to hear is what skills do you think you've kind of used most or have been most helpful uh, for you in your time as commissioners? Um, I can go first again, if you like. Um, um, I First of all, I have a very deep interest in helping unhoused residents and in building homes for all incomes and abilities. Uh, Senator Bell pointed me in the right direction at one of his coffee uh, talks when he told me that there were unhoused De Anza students. Um, second, I like people. In 2017, I started attending city council meetings, commission meetings, chamber of commerce meetings, the Valco special area meetings. I was impressed with the vitality of the people I met, people from all across the city. Thirdly, I had 10 years of management experience in the federal government at NASA Ames Research Center. And fourthly, I have an MBA in public administration from Harvard University. And that is so helpful when working with all the educated intelligent and creative people in Cupertino and the Bay Area. So those were the four things that I think are my strong points, um, but particularly my interest in the purpose of the Housing Commission. And so I defer to Tisha. Nisha. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I have a very, uh, I, I bring a, a slightly different angle to, to the role of the commissioner. Um, I think the most important thing for a commissioner is to bring um, a sense of deep curiosity and as well as a commitment to serving the needs of the community mm -hmm. and being open minded. Um, and the reason I say that is because there is quite a bit of work involved with being a commissioner. Um, it is really, you know, what you put into it. Certain commissions have more time demand than other commissions. and it's really important to do the homework, read the staff reports, do your own research, really talk to and stay engaged with the community through organizations like this, but there's also other organizations across the city that represent different, different voices of the community and really making sure that you're curious and you bring that curiosity to your commission is really important. Um, the second thing is keeping an open mind. Uh, you would be surprised as you know, I, I think a lot of people come in with, oh, I, you know, I want to get this done. I want to get this done, which is really great. But also recognizing that sometimes you might only have a piece of a really big puzzle. And from your perspective, you might have a specific opinion, but your responsibility as a commissioner is really to listen to all of the different pieces that are out there and put it together in a way that is just and equitous for all of the people who live in our community. So um, I would say those are probably the two areas that um, are you know, the most uh, beneficial for the city in terms of coming in as a new commissioner. And then personally, um, when before I had joined the commission, it was all uh, it was all men. And actually, when I had joined, I think I was the youngest on the commission by something like 20 years. Um, so it's uh, sometimes just like bringing your perspective can be so dramatically different than what actually exists. And that's not to say that other voices you know, don't have their own validity, but creating diversity on the commissions does bring a pretty substantial difference um, for, for what kind of commission decisions get made. So it's definitely important to make your voice heard and to really have confidence in the opinions and the research and uh, the listening that you do. Thank you for those answers to, again, really 
really incredible, very kind of different and diverse bringing up perspectives on how to get into the city commissioner game. Um, well, another question I have is, uh, where do you think the city needs new fresh voices right now? Well, I'll go first. <laughs> um, and I think where we need fresh voices is in housing and education, both. Um, housing of all kinds, but definitely affordable housing, such as rentals and multifamily complexes. Although Valco is being built with 2,402 units, half of which are below market rate, the new state goal for Cupertino is 6,000 homes, more than 6,000 homes, many of which will be BMR, which is short for below market rate, sorry. This will take significant planning and communication uh, to find a way to build that many homes. The housing element, which is what um, the housing commission is part of, and the general plan will be updated in the next two years and old solutions just aren't going to work. The key need is to find locations. Destination Home, who is a nonprofit who builds homes, affordable homes, has many sources of funds, but they need help from cities to find locations, whether they're unused or lightly used buildings or land. Um, and the best way to help unhoused residents is by building housing. That needs to be the main focus. We just don't have enough homes for everyone who lives here. However, the needs of unsheltered people are growing because of the economic downturn and because of COVID. Humanitarian aid through nonprofits such as the West Valley Community Services is absolutely critical until housing can be built. Locations for temporary housing, temporary shelter, tiny homes, any of those things are critical parts of this humanitarian aid. Um, and that is part and parcel of what we do. And so my focus is really part of what our housing commission does. So although I'm not actually an advocate and I do listen to people, it, 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 it does kind of <laughs> go like this. Um, my second thing where I think that we need more um, new voices is our relationship with the Anza College. Residents do not necessarily know what a jewel we have with this fine community college in our midst. Upon retirement from NASA, I studied French at De Anza College, 2005 to 2008, but those are the first two numbers I learned and so I say them that way. But anyway, Laura Karst was among the best professors I've had in my life at De Anza College. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I guess I'll, I'll finish with just that. Thank you. Well, I will, um, you know, echo a lot of what um, Connie has said. I actually graduated, talk about being completely Cupertino. I went to Montessori here, Stevens Creek, Kennedy, Monta Vista, as well as De Anza College and love it. It was, I also went to Georgetown afterwards, um, but De Anza by far was one of the greatest experiences of my entire life. So I, I completely agree that it's a it's a hidden or a, a gem that's un, untapped in terms of community relations right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that transportation is one of the areas that we do need fresh voices and fresh perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, right now we are in a time where we might be sheltering in place, but very soon that's not going to be the case. And we're gonna see a lot of issues coming out because one, there's barely any accessible public transportation into the city. It is not effective. Um, and as a person who is a who has their own vehicle to move around, that might be okay for me, but that's not for a significant number of the population. And we also have to think about what our Cupertino population is, which leads me into housing. Um, I, you know, I think that making sure that we can have a diverse community within Cupertino living there in different kinds of housing is important. I think it's also really critical to actually look at the population of Cupertino. Cupertino is a city that has an aging population. And because we don't have other places that people can live, we have a lot of members of the community who are aging in their homes. I personally do not want my parents to have to, as they continue to get older, have to move to you know, some way North Bay area or Gilroy, just so that they can move into a slightly smaller place and leave their community that they have spent, you know, 
35 plus years living in. Um, and that is happening to a significant portion of Cupertino residents. And that's actually a growing problem. Um, on Parks and Recreation, we actually look at um, what the populace looks like and what we project the populace to be so that we can build and provide the right services for the community. Um, so that's where a lot of this is coming from. I honestly did not know until I had started doing work on the commission what the data looked like. It's not really like, oh, I feel this way. It's like, no, the data is showing us that Cupertino residents are really changing in terms of age demographic. So providing alternative places for seniors to uh, live but still maintain residents in the community that they love so much is really important. And that will also make space and make room for other younger families to move in. Um, you know, that also has trickle down both economically as well as with our schools. If we want our schools to maintain the high standards that they have, we have to have kids in those schools. And to make sure there are families to put their kids in those schools, we have to make sure that the houses are affordable for young families to move into. So I would say that transportation and housing are the two primary, um, primary things that the city really needs some fresh voices in. Thank you both for those answers. And so for one final question, and maybe this one can be like a little bit quicker, a little bit more fun as a question. Uh, yeah. What is your most rewarding experience in your time as a commissioner? Oh, I can, I can jump in first this time. Um, oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, it's uh, it's a combination of things. One is um, really getting to know um, more community members. That's been the best. I've lived in Cupertino my whole life and I'm meeting more and more and more people every year. And it's awesome. And it's everyone who's engaged and connected or even people who've been kind of on the outskirts and you know maybe they filled out a form once, but suddenly they're like, oh, I'm really excited. I wanna get engaged. That would be the most, um, I, I think that's one of the best parts is really like getting deeper into community in, in Cupertino. And then also starting to see some of the tangible results um, and seeing things actually pass that we've been working on. So the master plan, um, we got approval for an all-inclusive all playground in Jollyman Park with $1.5 million in funding um, from the county. We've seen you know the dog off leash area. We're seeing a lot of really cool things and it's fun to see all this like research and hard work and effort that you put in actually turn into something really good for the community. And knowing that like, you know, in 15 years when I'm in my forties, I'm going to be able to say like, Hey, like, you know, to my kids, like, you see that, like when I was on the commission, we actually built that, or we actually saw that development. So um, I, I think those are probably the two best uh, parts about being a commissioner. Well, I can I can certainly I can certainly feel uh, the uh, the same kinds of things that I have felt as well. And I wanted to um, talk about the fact that um, when I came to the commission, I was particularly interested in encouraging the city to develop a program for unhoused students at De Anza. When I first mentioned it to a citizen outside, uh, I was surprised that there was like be any pushback at all. And then I really found there was more. I was uh, surprised, um, but that was my specific interest. And it was then we got it into our city work plan that year and that took a year and then it was carried into 2020. Um, and it was uh, part of our work plan and we were working on it and there was going to be an unhoused program, a program for unhoused students. Well, then what happened was that uh, there were budget cuts needed due to COVID. The council makes final decisions about work items. This unhoused student program was almost deleted to make space for a housing survey. If I didn't go to all the city council meetings like I am wont to do, I would never have known that. But they were, it was an agenda item. They discussed deleting the $50,000 from the unhoused, <coughs> excuse me, students program for a $25,000 housing survey. As a resident, Therefore, because not as a not as a housing commission, because we voted for it, right? But as a resident, I spoke up and said, "Hey, look someplace else for your twenty-five thousand dollars for the housing survey." And I also contacted Deanza College representatives who had been had presented to the council earlier that year, uh, so that they would know about that agenda item, and they had time to then comment on it. The council did ultimately keep both items, although they did reduce the budget for the unhoused 
students, but at least they didn't cut it entirely out. And it is on our housing division webpage now. Um, so I have to admit coming in two years ago with uh, the idea of having a housing program for students, it, it took a lot of work, but I felt very pleased that it has now shown up on our housing division work page. Um, and we also have um, a work item for funding programs for unhoused, other unhoused residents on the, on the Housing Commission. That in, that's what that's about is funding that we give to West Valley and other, other uh, vulnerable citizens. Um, that was all approved unanimously from um, our, our commission. At a council meeting early last spring, <clears throat> I heard a report out, not an agenda item, I just happened to be at the meeting because I go to them. I heard a report that the city planned to remove the people from the encampment at 280 immediately at the close of COVID, which at that time was a few weeks ago. And that's a long time ago. That was in the spring when that was going to happen. Um, since it was not an agenda item, I was surprised as well as then horrified. Um, just hearing the words as they were spoken, I spoke up immediately. And fortunately, other residents then did step up to advocate also. Fortunately, the council did decide to take the lawful, respectful, and human way forward. Staff worked with the county to plan for places for our unhoused residents to move. And so I will say that it's probably not as fun a job as maybe some others, but I have to admit, since I care about it, it was fun for me to have that happen. Uh, I mean, to be able to successfully advocate. And secondly, I wanted to build on what, um, what Nisha was saying about building relationships with other commissions like bike ped and planning, also uh, city staff. And here's a shout out for all of you that wanna go for a housing commissioner, Carrie Hoosler, who's our commission liaison is just terrific. Um, also council members, the people at West Valley Community Services and De Anza College. And, I fi and finally, I met uh, advocates for extremely low income and intellectually development disabled people. And I learned about advocating for them and other vulnerable people. And that is another work item. I think I told you about that earlier on our plan. And um, if I have another minute, I did wanna end with a shout out uh, for former mayor Savita Vajanathan. I voted for her originally because among her many good qualifications was that she had been on the board at West Valley Community Services. And that part of her background spoke directly to my heart. She was instrumental in the successful veranda project, which houses seniors and formerly unhoused people. So I'll close with that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to both of you for sharing all your experiences. It's so great to kind of hear back from the incredibly passionate people we've already got working in our commissions. And it certainly makes me more passionate about getting my application in soon. Um, so we'll quickly go over some of the more logistical questions. Uh, so first of all, you might be wondering after hearing all this stuff, what vacancies are available? Uh, as you can see there, I've listed helpfully all the vacancies in one giant word soup. Uh, two places that we're gonna wanna point to you specifically, uh, given CFA's mission and also some of the things that we've talked about here. Two key commission vacancy or key commissions that have vacancies are the Housing Commission, which Connie's currently serving on, as well as the Planning Commission, both of which are really strongly tied in uh, to questions of housing and transportation. And they're really high impact areas that you might wanna get involved in. Uh, some other things that you might be concerned about are eligibility. There is, uh, for all these committees, except for the audit, uh, there is a Cupertino residency requirement and you will, as a result of a law passed in 1974, have to file a financial disclosure. So be wary. Um, the process for applying, you have an online application followed by in-person interviews. The in-person interviews are, from my understanding, roughly five minutes or so, is that correct? Yes. Uh, perfect. And then the applications for the uh, for these commissions are due at 4.30 p.m. on Friday, January 8th. And then the interviews will start taking place about two weeks later on the 25th and the 26th. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing all your information. Uh, Thank you so much.
Can I actually add a little nugget uh, to the logistics portion? Um, if you are considering applying, which I really hope you do, um, because we need more voices, on, uh, diverse voices on our commissions, um, be sure that before your interview, you have attended um, the meetings. I know now we're a little bit tight in terms of um, timing for January, but if you can attend a commission meeting, a city council meeting, and then also online um, on the Cupertino website, all of the meeting minutes and uh, video recordings for certain commissions are actually available. And I would highly recommend that you take a look at a couple of those meetings so you have a good understanding of what's happening in those commissions, the status of various projects, so that when you come into your interview, the questions are typically, you know, tell us why you're interested, have you been to a meeting, and, you know, what vision or what ideas are you going to bring to the commission. That way, when you're bringing up your ideas, you have an, have an idea of what's actually happening in the commission, and hopefully that will set you up for success. Perfect, thank you, that's great advice. Uh, so we've talked through our uh, kind of city commission perspective. We now have Larissa, Larissa with us. So we'll go back to the kind of broad overview. Um, Larissa Casillas is the program director of the leadership development and advocacy uh, at Urban Habitat and a manager of the board and commission leadership institute. So she's got all the information about boards and commissions. And so we're really excited to have her with us. Um, Larissa, could you tell us a little bit more about Urban Habitat and specifically your institute's mission? Yes. Hello. Um, I just also want to start off by apologizing uh, for being late. My bad. Um, I like to, I'll just say it was a little pandemic brain that made me misread the, um, the clock. But anyway, so Urban Habitat, um, for folks who don't know, we are based here in Oakland. Um, and we focus on three policy areas, equitable land development, housing rights, and transportation justice. Um, and we look at these uh, three policy areas with a regional lens. So we, um, we work in the nine Bay Area counties with partners on the ground um, around you know, some items that you've already heard about, the general plan, um, transportation funding, um, you know, uh, land use, creating parks, looking at our communities and how our communities are created. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, and after everything we do, we look at it through a race lens, um, believing that, you know, a lot of decisions that are being made, not only on boards and commissions, but city council all the way up. Um, haven't always been um, to the benefit and well-being of Black and Brown low-income communities. Um, boards, uh, BCLI, Urban Habitat, started the BCLI um, in 20, 2010. Oh my gosh. Um, and we started it as a strategy to advance our policy issues on uh, boards and commissions. And we actually uh, were working around the general plan in Richmond um, when one of our organizers uh, working with community folks to get them involved in the general plan, um, she was actually asked, invited to, um, to apply to the Richmond Planning Commission. And it was at that point that we realized, oh, look, you know, this group of community members that have been working to ensure that the general plan, you know, looks and feels like you know, their community and the way that they want to see their community, you know, in decades. Um, she was really interfacing a lot with the commission, as was the community. So um, it was sort of like this aha moment where we realized, oh, yeah, commissions is a decision making place that is really important, um, not only for our policy areas, but also to ensure that residents have a voice in these decisions. So yeah, that's um, Urban Habitat, and you can learn more by going to urbanhabitat.org. Um, yeah, and then you know you can learn more about the BCLI there. We're actually about to kick off our 12th cohort, um, which is really hard to believe. And I actually went through the uh, boards and commissions training in 2012. Um, and we kick off uh, the fellowship with a six month intensive training. And we have, I think about 160 alumni now and the majority are still in the Bay Area. Um, and we average about a third of our alumni um, serving on a board or commission at any one time. Wow, it's incredible. Um, 
Thank you so much for all that information. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on kind of the history of the BCLI and why you guys really focused in on uh, boards and commissions as so important to making the changes in the issue areas that urban habitat is concerned about? Yeah, so definitely, um, you know, but as I said earlier, one of our staff people was serving on the, was invited to serve on the planning commission in Richmond. And part of the reason was that she had really strong um, ties to community members. And the idea was that she would be bringing those, uh, that vision from the community to the commission. Um, certainly not all commissions are um, decision-making commissions, right? Or policy-making commissions. The majority of them are advisory. But nonetheless, we believe that by having, you know, by training folks and preparing them to serve on commissions with the racial equity lens, we are changing the conversation about what our communities should look like, what we want them to look like, what we want them to feel like. And, um, you know, opening it up, it's not, some folks think that the BCLI is like a diversity program where we're diversifying commissions. And certainly we are based on the folks that we are working with and training. But it's more than that. It's, you know, um, our decision making bodies in our communities need to hear from us, need to hear from people who have lived experiences. And you've already heard this from Connie and Nisha. You know, they are bringing their lived experience to the table um, and advising city council, boards of supervisors, boards of board, to, you know, the direction in which they want their communities to go to. And we don't often, um, the folks we work with, unfortunately, our uh, points of view or our lived experience isn't always taken into consideration um, because we're not at the table, basically. So it's also a way for us not only to advance our issues, but it's a way for us to ensure that those who are uh, most impacted by our issues are at the table um, responding and creating solutions. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so with that in mind, uh, what sort of, so we've heard that there's a, a diversity problem in lots of boards and commissions around here. What sort of skills and traits do you think we're leaving out uh, from those boards and commissions by not having that diversity? Where should we try, what kind of people should we be trying to uh, recruit? And what sorts of skills are we looking for to get these more diverse, more uh, inclusive, more powerful commissions together? Yeah, you know, when I start working with fellows through the BCLI, um, one of their main concerns is, I don't, you know, I, um, I might not know everything. I don't know everything there is to know about planning, for example, or how am I going to serve on the rent board? I don't know everything there, you know, I need to know about tenant and landlord rights. Um, and, you know, what I say to them is that the vast majority of people who are on commissions right now are not experts, uh, you know, around, you know, um, uh, Parks and Rec, let's say, or the rent board or, you know, um, you know, uh, all of these issues. It's not as if, and let me just back up and say that the reason that I really love working on commissions and working with people to prepare them to serve on commissions is that I believe that commissions is this great experiment in our democracy where our um, city council, our decision-making bodies invite residents to come and advise them on policy. Um, and so when, we, so when we are only hearing from a certain um, group of people, um, like Nisha said, you know, before she came onto the Parks and Rec, it was all men. Well, you know, men have a very um, specific lived experience. They have a very specific perspective, um, different from a young woman like Nisha or different from someone whose neighborhood may not actually have a park or, you know, versus people who, you know, may be more affluent folks who, you know, have higher education and live in certain neighborhoods. So by only hearing from one sector of the community, we're leaving out an entirely a, you know, a whole other sector of the community. And unfortunately, historically, that's the community that's been left out, right? So um, I tell people that, you know, you come with passion and you come with commitment um, and you will learn 
along the way because the people who you serve on the commission with they're not experts either many times you know they just want to help their community they want to get involved but like connie interested in housing issues what can i do you know how can i you know use my relationships how can i leverage you know my knowledge and background to make something happen um so when we talk about like a specific skill set you know i feel like you know the skill set is um and i'm going to repeat what nisha said earlier you know i feel like the skill set is relationship building the skill set is being committed to your community and going back to your community and making sure that you're hearing from them about you know what is important to them around the issue that you're working on on your commission um, and commitment you know um, for the bcli we do require that people have some kind of relationship with a community-based organization um, and in the past we have had amazing applicants who are complete superstars but they don't have that relationship to a community organization. And so I do feel like that's something really important because if you have, you know, a relationship with an organization um, such as a Cooper Tuner for All, you, you know other community members, but you also know where to go to get, you know, encouragement, support, advice, ideas. Um, so I think that's really important. Oh, fantastic. Um Maybe this is a little bit uh, too much down your alley as part of the BCLI, but what resources would you recommend to help get people prepared either <laughs> in their time as commissioners or even for just the application process to make sure that they're kind of in the right headspace for pursuing this? Yes, yes. Well, of course, you could always apply to the BCLI, urbanhabitat.org. Um, but, you know, actually, I'm just going to repeat what Nisha said. Um, she said exactly what I wanted to share in that you're interested in the commission go to the commission meetings. And now that they're online, super easy. You know, definitely I like echo a hundred times, go through the agenda and go through the meeting minutes because, you know, exactly what she said, it's gonna give you a sense of what's been discussed and what the discussions are like. Um, and I would actually also encourage people to reach out to a commissioner. You know, you're interested in housing, reach out to Connie. Here she is, you know, um, reach out to commission staff. It's actually really hard sometimes for commission staff to find people interested and committed to serve on commissions. So my experience has been that they're generally really open to talking and sharing about the commission and kind of what their vision is for, you know, what do they think a good commissioner um, would look like. Um, and then also two of the things that we uh, um, uh, bring to the table through BCLI is an understanding of the Brown Act, um, which is our sunshine transparency public meeting laws, and also an understanding, like a foundational understanding of Robert's rules. Even though I know that not all commissions um, apply Robert's rules, um, I feel like it's one of those technical things where you kind of get stuck, and then it, you know, rather than encouraging you to, you know, really be engaged, I feel like some people just sort of, you know, revert back. So I would say, you know, um, those two. And a lot of times the city or county that your commission is a part of will uh, give you kind of these overviews. But that's it really. It's really about relationship building, honestly. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, I think that's that was really helpful for me in my kind of getting to terms with my own application. So I hope it's been really helpful for everyone. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to our final set of panelists. Uh, boom, got there in three clicks. Uh, our final, oh no, I did not get there in three clicks. Now I got there in five clicks. Uh, so our final set of panelists will be our county uh, level panelists. We've got uh, two incredible uh, panelists, one of whom is uh, Raina Lari, who is a county level commissioner. The other of whom is Tarshree Krishnan who is the deputy chief of staff at Senator Dave Cortez's office, formerly supervisor Dave Cortez, so she's got lots of experience at the county level as well. So uh, could both of you tell us about your experiences working in around county commissions, whether that be directly as a commissioner or kind of working more along the political side, so you're working alongside them? So um, 
I'm really, uh, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, so um, I actually um, uh, wanted to be an effective advocate for my community. Um, and it's like a, a personal story because um, I found my son was sick with Lyme disease and uh, I was trying to figure out what was wrong with him. And we had to go to like 25 doctors to find out uh, what was really going on. Um, so I was really surprised and shocked that uh, there was not enough awareness. So then I realized that if I wanted to see changes in the system, I need to participate. Um, so being part of the commission, I realized that I do have a voice, I, I can make an impact. Um, even though we don't make policy decisions, we provide the input to make um, informed decisions um, and actually assist in the formation of policy. So that was my reason for, uh, it was a personal reason to join the commission because I wanted people to know that Lyme disease does exist in California. Uh, people thought that, well, even doctors believed that uh, Lyme disease was basically an East Coast disease. And so people were falling sick and they had no idea what was going on because with climate change and everything, Lyme disease had spread uh, to the Bay Area. Um, and uh, so I've just had an amazing experience because I was able to advocate for it. And uh, uh, with Tara's help and uh, Senator Dave Cortese's help, we were able to pass a commendation. So now, you know, if somebody goes to a doctor and they, uh, they can go to tell and tell them that there is Lyme disease does exist in California. Um, so I've just had an amazing experience. Um, so I would just tell everybody who wants to make an impact or change the system to join a border commission, because then you do have a voice. So that was my reason for joining uh, the Health Advisory Commission. It's been a wonderful experience. And I've just been there for a year, so I haven't been there long. Thank you so much, Raina. Uh, how about you, Tara? Yeah, well, thanks, Eric, uh, for the invitation and especially excited to be here with our amazing D3 Health Advisory Commissioner. Um, and I have not been a county commissioner, but I was um, a staff member for a county supervisor, Dave Cortezzi. Um, so hopefully I can shed some insight on um, the appointment process um, and some advice on how to apply. Um, and there are a few key differences from the county commissions um, and the city commissions. So at the county, there's over 75 boards and commissions. So there are a lot more opportunities um, to serve and the county provides different services. So we're uh, the count, I no longer work at the county, but the county um, is often seen as the community safety net. So it covers public health, um, the county hospital system, public safety and justice as our sheriff's office, DA, um, public defender, um, also social services, child support services. So depending on your interest area, you may be more interested in a county commission. And um, just to highlight it, there are probably a lot more opportunities at the county just because there's a lot more um, commissions. And just this past year, created um, several task force that are more short term so there we had the unhoused task force um, the community correction law enforcement committee and the racial health um, and equity disparity board so those often come up like shorter term task forces where you can get appointed um, and some key pieces of advice um, a lot of folks just apply online, but the board of the board members receive hundreds and hundreds of applications. So I would advise you not to just apply online, but to set up a meeting with your supervisor or even with a staff member. Um, and I can put my email in the chat if I'm happy to help make any connection to any of the offices um, or their staff. Um, and you really, unlike the city commission where um, the city council votes on the appointments um, for the county, you, you really just need the support of one county supervisor, one of the five county supervisors, and they will place um, 
your appointment on the agenda and the entire board votes on it, but I've never seen um, I've never seen a vote not be unanimous. So you really just need the support of one county supervisor. And um, so really the trick is just to make that one connection. Um, so like for instance, Raina, um, we met through um, one of Dave's really strong partners in the community. She gave a glowing recommendation and there happened to be a vacancy. So even though if Raina maybe applied online, she's really qualified, really impressive, but through the hundreds of applications, you know, we, we maybe never would have seen it. So it's, it's advice like that I wanted to share. Um, so those are the big differences between city and county. Um, let me think if there's anything else. I took notes. Um, oh, and the last thing I wanted to mention is um, you really just have to um, live in the county to be appointed. So a lot of folks, like if you're in Cupertino, your supervisor is Joe Simidian, but um, most of the commission seats are not district specific. So I know in D3, we even had um, like our senior care commissioner was a Cupertino resident. So um, you don't have to just go to the D5 supervisor. You can, you can, if you look at the vacancy list, which I'm sure Eric will have the link to that up. Um, if the commission you want to sit on is, if there's no opening in, in D5, you can go to a different supervisor. Most of the seats are not district specific. Um, so those are the key points. Um, someone's asking, when are county council openings? So yeah, so here's the other major difference is they're rolling appointments. So you can really be appointed at any time, as long as it's on a, a board meeting agenda. So it, that's another difference in the city. Well, thank you very much, Tara. That's answered so many questions that I even had written down. So we can really get through some of these ones. Uh, one thing that I think you already mentioned quite heavily, but it might be worth you to just dig down a little bit further on it, is what issue areas would you say are best pursued at the county versus the city level? Um, obviously, the responsibilities are somewhat overlapping, but there might be certain places that you would be more interested in one or the other. Yeah, I'd, and I, I know that Raina will have a lot to say too, but it's really the services that the county provides, um, which are our social services, safety net services, um, which is different than uh, the city. Um, and also our public safety, our county fire. Um, so it's, it's really just uh, the departments are different. But Raina, did you have a, anything um, there? You know, um, I decided to apply to the to Santa Clara County uh, because uh, they have more parks. So I was interested in raising awareness about Lyme disease, and so um, this the county, is, um, you know, being involved with the Health Advisory Commission just made more sense um, because you know they are they just have larger parks, um, and I wanted um, to let make sure that at some point their signage is there and people are aware that. Uh, you know, if you go to a, a park, you need to take certain precautions because Lyme disease exists there. So um, it depends what your objective also is. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Lanta also, like it's oh, 1.8 million people in the county, um, and they're like 15 cities. Um, so if you want to make an impact, you know, that's larger number of cities. That's yeah, fantastic. Think about that kind of different layer of just how many more people you can be impacting. Um, one more question that we might have is kind of how do local commissions uh, or re county commissions interact with their local counterparts? How do they interact with the county level government? Um, obviously, like we've noted, there are some slightly overlapping uh, areas of interest. Are there like strong connections between the different things? Or are they more insular? connections between the commissions and, and the county departments or the commissions and the county commissions and the city commissions? Uh, great question. Uh, I was thinking of both, thank you. Okay. Well, um, the commissions, like for instance, the Senior Care Commission works really closely with the County Department of Aging and Adult Services. Um, and so th there is a strong connection with the staff and the department heads of that 
department and the corresponding commission. And in terms of the board of supervisors, it really depends on each office. There are so many commissions that um, each board member cannot track every commission. So like for instance, um, there was one of, I, I'll keep saying Supervisor Cortez. Now Senator Cortez's, I'm getting used to saying that. His initiative, one of his initiatives was waiving the fees for the medical marijuana ID cards. Um, so that item he pushed through the Health Advisory Commission. So Raina and him worked closely on that. And um, one of the reasons we did that is because we have a very strong commissioner in the D3C on that commission. So um, some commissioners have like that stronger line of communication with the staff or with um, the elected. Um, so it really just depends. In terms of the county commissions, speaking to the city commissions, I um, haven't been aware of that type of communication. Um, but Raina, are you aware of, of that? Actually, I'm not. Uh... Yeah, I, it, I think a, a lot of that would just be, you know, um, networking and events like this. Totally makes sense. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, final question from us. Uh, how would you say that your time working at the county has impacted your experience uh, working with local issues? Yeah, definitely. Like you, I'm definitely more interested in local issues now because I feel like I do have a voice and I can make a difference. Um, so you feel like you own things more, I think, being part of the um, commission, definitely. Yeah, and I would just to add to that, I'd say that um, I know myself and uh, my boss, um, we, we do this work to represent um, folks that serve on commissions and our constituents. And so that's the reason why we pursue this work is to hear the concerns and suggestions of um, our residents. And a lot of that comes from the work of commissioners. You know, they're that sort of layer between the elected office and the community. So um, we really value um, that type of partnership. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all that info. And fortunately for me, uh, lots of this kind of county logistics stuff has already been touched on briefly by Tara, so I can just speed right through it so we can get to that big Q&A at the end. Um, like she said, there is a, a count, you must be a county resident, uh, but you can apply for commissions outside of your own district. Uh, by my count, there are 18 vacancies that specifically list uh, council members or supervisors submitting, but there's around 246 vacancies. And I think somebody else also posted this in the chat where you can find the link to the complete list. Uh, it can be a little bit daunting to go through, uh, but my, from, uh, from my personal experience, if you just do the control F for vacant, much easier to look through all those. Um, finally, there is an online application, but I think also as Tara said, great advice. It makes sense to make connections with whoever, uh, the staff of whoever you're actually applying for their specific uh, uh, district's commission uh, vacancy. And then finally, she also said, the uh, unlike the city commissions, the applications are made on rolling, or the applications are accepted on a rolling basis by the supervisor making the appointments and uh, a vote afterwards. So it's uh, as opposed to kind of the really short term, uh, shorter time frame on the application for the city. This might be something if you're more interested in looking at a longer term thing. It might be easier to apply for one of these commissions. So with that in mind, as uh, Kriti mentioned in the chat, we're going to move to our final ten, our final. Uh, bits of Q&A. Obviously, we don't want to make all the uh, panelists stay longer than we had previously told them they had to stay. Uh, it's a Saturday morning, after all. We can't deprive you of that Saturday morning, but if any of you are willing to stick around and answer some questions, we'd be uh, thrilled to have you stick around for just a little bit longer. Um, feel free to raise your question or raise your hand in the Zoom and we'll uh, unmute you and let you talk, or uh, we'll start going back and reading through some of the questions that uh, people had already asked earlier on. I'll jump in with um, some questions that were asked earlier in the chat. Um, uh, one that comes to mind that I'd love to highlight is from Anna. How much do you feel like you learn about these topics on the job versus from prior education? 
and any of our panelists feel free to chime in. Yeah. I see Nisha, go ahead and then Connie. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I had mentioned this um, earlier, which was it's, you know, I think that it's important to remain really curious and very inclusive of the approach that you take when you're listening to this. I think that's really the most important thing, because like I said, you might have a specific experience, um, but you don't necessarily know everything that's happening. So it doesn't necessarily even matter sometimes how much effort and how much research and even background experience you have, because sometimes when you're just sitting on the commission or on the board, you are given information and you're given tools that you just didn't have before. So there is a lot of on the job learning. That having been said, there are certain commissions that it's really helpful to have a background. Um, I would say like the tech, the tech commission, for example, like you should have an understanding of, so, you know, tech to be able to impact the city in that way. Similarly, like with planning, you don't necessarily need to have an advanced degree. However, it is helpful if you have experience in that area to make an effective uh, choice. But I, I do think a lot can be, um, you know, remedied by effort and, and the desire and willingness to be, to learn and be curious. Okay, I, I would certainly, as Con, this is Connie, I would certainly add to uh, what Nisha said, absolutely true, that um, you don't necessarily need and the information going in, but there's a lot of information that you're going to get from the commission itself. And also you do have to do um, some, some outreach and study. For the housing commission, I didn't have specifically experience in that, but I read the housing element. I, I met with a, um, a variety of people, read our agendas, all that stuff. And then there was more. I mean, think of all the various affording, uh, well, I wish I could name them. I can't get them off the top of my head, but I've been to many, many community meetings about affordable housing. And there are two critical systemic problems for instance, in instance, Cupertino's BMR and density bonus structures each have requirements within them that make it difficult to build um, affordable housing, even though that is their goal. And um, the financing structure for below market rate housing includes a layer cake, an actual layer cake of grants, loans, and tax breaks uh, from various stakeholders, federal, state, county, and private funding. I didn't know any of that stuff <laughs> before. And now I can you know, give you a little pitch on it, but I'll stop there. Um, so I just think it's, uh, it's important for people to understand they don't need to know all that when they sign up, but they will be um, learning that as they, they get into it. And also you're able to bring experts in. So for example, I was able to get people from the Bay Area Line Foundation, you know, to educate um, all of us um, about some things that you know, we yeah. didn't quite know. About. Exactly. Yeah. I hope people uh, don't have uh, imposter syndrome with this because, yeah. uh, everyone has a good perspective and you come from a unique set of experiences that will be helpful. The way that you look at an issue fundamentally is going to be different than the next person. And especially if you're bringing a fresh voice and a fresh perspective to your commissioner board, that makes all the difference. So don't, you know, don't stop yourself from playing, you know, don't count yourself out before you even try to play the game. Good point. Awesome, thank you. Um, now, quick kind of rapid fire type question. How many hours does it take per week, let's say, to be a commissioner in your experience? And this question is from Vanidia. For who? It, from Valeria for everyone, for all of our commissioners. I can answer that because uh, going in, I thought, oh, this won't be too hard because you just have that one meeting a month and you prepare for it from that week and there, there it's, it's done, but that's uh, just not really it. If you want to really understand it and all, it, it, it will go as far to as many hours as you are interested and willing to put in, quite frankly. But it does have a minimum, <laughs> going to the meetings and getting smart on your package that you're gonna be talking about. Yes, I agree. It's totally up to you how much time. You know, you can really go deep into an issue and spend like endless hours. It's uh, totally <laughs> how you want to do it. Great. 
And then we have one more question. Um, how was the application interview process for you? It sounds like different um, jurisdictions, whether at the city or the county, have different processes. I've heard different processes at other cities. So I'd love to hear your experiences on what the interview process was like for you. Well, I can, mm -hmm. I can speak to that. It was a really interesting. Um, I was uh, appalled at first to know that it was going to be public. You know, public people can come sit and watch it. <laughs> so uh, what I did to practice was I actually went to some of the other ones because they're, they're, they're held on two days. So I went to some of them ahead of time as part of the public to see like how did that go with five people questioning you and people sitting around and that. So that took the mystery out of it. That was very helpful. Um, it's it's structured also. They ask specific questions, but they choose from them. And they kind of go round robin and ask them. And they can ask a question that's not there, too. And so um, that was, they gave me a choice of, you know, they, it was answering a very topical question for them then. They were working out what's going to be on the city work agenda. And they had a specific question, which wasn't on that. So you have to be ready for that. And um, since it's only five minutes, be prepared to say what you want to have, what you want to say as soon as possible, because you're going to run out of time so fast. That's all. <laughs> um, yeah, it's extremely, extremely short. Um, I, I think that in, in terms of, so it is the application online and then the interview and then they select for the vacant positions and then oftentimes they'll select a, a couple alternates as well because various reasons people either have to drop out or they miss too many meetings or whatever it is um and we do have alternates who join so don't feel like if you get an alternate it doesn't count because it definitely does and it's very uh those those folks who are selected you know we really hope that they stay in touch uh during the process um but one of the things I did was, and this is probably a little type A, but I made a list of all of the projects that I wanted to see implemented and my priorities. And I brought that um, to the council when I went um, because I, I was like five minutes. I'm obviously a very, fairly verbose person. So I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to communicate this. And so I just was like, here is this is what you're doing. These are my thoughts on them. And this is what I want to do. Um, so that was, that's what I did. Again, I think that's a little type A, but, um, you know, it's a good way of alternating. It, it's a good way of supplementing the interview with other information that you have. And then I also spoke to, um, a couple of the city council members, um, just, you know, 30 minute coffees. This was of course eight years ago, but, um, it was very helpful, um, to have that conversation as well, because I didn't realize specific commission, uh, specific city council members do have issue areas that they are particularly passionate about. So it's also just good to like do my homework and my research and learn kind of what they're interested in. Can I just uh, add to what uh, Nisha said about she, she was type A and she took in a list. When I went to a couple of the other um, commission uh, interviews, I saw that people were turning something in. And I thought, oh, I had written a letter to the editor um, 300 word one uh, for the Cupertino Courier, uh, an open letter to Tim Cook about housing. And so I thought, whoa. <laughs> so I, uh, I uh, made copies and turned that in. So um, whether that was useful or not, who knows, but I did see that other people did that. So as a word, if you've got some talent that you want to um, exhibit, be sure to turn it in. Awesome. Any comments from, looks like Raina, we can, ask you to unmute um, or Tara about the county. So as Tara said, they get so many applications, it's really important to follow up um, and pursue it um, um, because it can, it's easy for your application to get lost. So yeah, I just reiterate to try to make that connection with a staff member in one of the board of supervisors office um, and because sometimes they're the ones doing the legwork and the administrative work of actually putting the appointment through the system um, or just maybe getting a meeting with the supervisor themselves if that's possible. Um, but yeah, just I would I wouldn't recommend just applying online because that it's likely to not be looked at. 
And any notes from Larissa or Hung as uh, from your perspectives? No, I really, this is great. I have nothing really to, um, the only thing I would say is I echo what Tara just said. It's really critical to make a connection with a staff person, you know, whether it's city council or the supervisor's office. So you want them to remember your name. Um, and if possible, you wanna meet with them. And that's also another opportunity for you to share what you're interested in. Um, yeah, so I would just echo that. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just a final, final wrap up um, in 30 seconds. If you have any final words of advice for all of our prospective commissioners here or key takeaways that you hope that people walk away with today. I know you've been dropping wisdom this entire time. So no worries if there's nothing in particular you'd like to highlight. Um, I think um... This is Letty said, you know, earlier I said that it's really about relationships and relationship building. Um, and my one uh, key advice would be that, you know, oftentimes people are on a commission and they want to jump in and start running. And it's okay to give yourself some time to get to know who the other commissioners are. Um, you know, uh, many years ago, I had an elected official say to me, you know, there are, um, there are bad relationships um, and good policy doesn't come out of those, but good policy comes out of good relationships. And so, you know, you want to know who else is on the commission and why are they on the commission? You know, what brought them to the commission? What are their interests? So I would, um, my advice is to take time to get to know who you're serving on the commission with and also get to um, know the commission staff because uh, they can, you know, be friends and allies. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. It looks like, oh, Tari, did you want to oh, say something? Well, one thing I just forgot to mention is the county also has a youth task force. So it's for students ages eight through 12, um, in case anyone on the call knows a student who wants to serve on a county commission, there, there's an uh, opportunity for them too. Oh, once again, thank you so much to everyone who came. Uh, special thank you to our panelists and speakers for, so, uh, Raina, was there something else you wanted to say that I cut you off? I'm so sorry. Yes, it, um, I just want people to know that as a commissioner, you can actually get um, something placed on the agenda. So if there's something you feel like the county, um, you know, is lacking for some reason, you can actually uh, pursue that interest. Um, and um, you know, move it forward. So, um, so like in our commission, different people are working on different things that they feel are important. I, I did wanna um, say a quick thing, which is uh, just do it. Um, sometimes <laughs> it might take you one or two you know, attempts, just do it. You are smart enough, you have enough talent, you approach it with curiosity and putting in community effort. Like it, it's great. There's nothing wrong with applying and not getting it and trying again. Um, but the community needs your voice. They need your input. They need your feedback and your perspective on all of the issues that we have. So, you know, you have the links here. You know which positions are open. Um, so please, please apply. And I really hope to see uh, the folks who join today um, on a board or commission next year or in, in future years. But thank you so much for having us. Um, Cupertino for all also. Well, once again, thank you everyone for coming. It's been, I've learned so much and I spent like the last week looking up counting uh, city commission stuff. So I really hope this has been as helpful for everyone else as it's been helpful for me. Uh, to reiterate just one final thing that I think uh, hopefully we've, we've done a good job of making clear. Just by virtue of coming to show up on this Saturday morning, you are more than capable of being a city commissioner. And we really, like if you're the pr kind of person who's willing to give up an hour of your Saturday, you're probably the kind of person who's willing to give up an hour or or two on a weeknight. So really you've got, you've got that number one qualification done. Um, so thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, like I said earlier, CFA is, um, we, we're really passionate about trying to make sure that everyone who's applying to these commissions this year stays connected with each other so we can be a good support network for each other during the application process. So please uh, stay in contact with us. You can either start sending us emails at cupertinoforall.gmail.com. We're lonely, we'd like the extra emails or join our Facebook page in our community. Um, 
we've got lots of exciting stuff that's happening next year. And we'd really like to make sure that as many folks who are passionate about the issues of, of equity and inclusivity in our city stay in contact with us as possible. And we're really excited for all the stuff that's going to happen next. So thank you once again for everyone uh, who showed up. And uh, we hope to see you on commission soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you very much for having me. So much. Thank Happy you. holidays. Thanks yeah. a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you.